it's going to be a evolution in the growth of liners from 1858 to about 1940. And so uh, this first picture is going to be a picture taken in Southampton of Queen Mary on the left and the Arnus Berengeri on the right. Queen Mary was basically built as Berengeri's replacement. Uh, these pictures, a lot of them, you're going to notice they are visually colorized by a friend of mine. His name is Steve Walker. Uh, he has a very good Facebook page. He's done so many pictures of different ships and interiors. They are just amazing to look at. It gives you a real sense of what these ships really looked like back in the day instead of a black and white picture. So, um, kind of wanted to start it with a bit of a questionnaire. Uh, you're going to notice there are several pictures and there are several ships in this picture at Southampton. Uh, first, you'll recognize the one on the right there. That's going to be the bearing area. And then there's also going to be a uh, three funnel liner in the middle. That's going to be the White Star Liner Majestic. Uh, those are two of the biggest ocean liners in the world at this time when this picture was taken. You'll also notice a, a rather smaller liner uh, on the left with just two funnels. Um, that is Homer, another White Star Liner. Uh, if I was going to say to you, how many large ships can you see in this picture? How many would you count? Uh, two? Three. Three? three. three. What if I told you there's secretly a fourth? If you look in the very back, you'll see another one back here tied up waiting for retirement. That is the RMS Mauritania and her crew scheme in the white. Uh, unfortunately, this is at the end of her career. She's just about be on her way to the scrapyard. So, uh, no, bit of a trick question. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, let's start. 1858, uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel comes up with the idea to build the biggest ship in the world so that he could sail all the way to Australia and back without having to reload with coal. Uh, doing a bit of math, he realizes that a ship at 600 feet long, 60 feet wide, and carrying up to 15,000 tons of coal would get in there. And so he did the math, came up with the SS Great Eastern, or as he called it, the Great Bay. Uh, launched in 1858. At the time, it was six times bigger than the next biggest ship below it, which was the Great Britain, which is about 3,300 tons. And so when the Great Eastern hit the water, it was literally the biggest thing in the world. When they tried to launch it in 1858, uh, it failed miserably. Uh, she ended up stuck on the stocks in the Thames in London for another two months before they could get her into the water. Uh, another eight months of getting her fitted out, and then she made her maiden voyage in 1859. Uh, unfortunately, on her trials, someone forgot to release one of the safety valves, and one of the steam lines broke, uh, exploded, and killed five men, and basically shot the first funnel into the air like a rocket. So not exactly the best way to start. Unfortunately, that also basically broke uh, Brunel. He died of a stroke a very short time later. Um, but she had a very sad career. She never made it to Australia. Every company that took her on basically went broke. So they tried doing several trips to uh, North America. Uh, she didn't do very well at that. She did a couple troop trips um, from Britain to Canada during the American Civil War, uh, carrying about 2,300 men at the time, and did that. And then after 1865, she did several uh, cable laying trips across the Atlantic, laying one of the first transatlantic cables continuously from Ireland to uh, Newfoundland, and did several more across the So basically, 1858, you're starting out at a weight of almost 19,000 tons and a length of uh, 692 feet. She will not be surpassed in size for quite some time when you consider everything else that was built around her. This is, believe it or not, the dining room on the Great Eastern. Uh, first thing you'll notice, uh, most of the chairs are not bolted or nailed down. Uh, Neither were the tables, the crockery, or anything like that. Um, at the time, 
this comes up every time a major ocean liner and big size gets built. Everyone thinks that because it's big enough, the North Atlantic is not going to have any effect on it. Uh, they learned their lesson very quickly. Uh, after the maiden voyage, they ran into a storm, I think, on this third voyage. And uh, according to John Maxton Graham, one of the ocean liner historians, they were taking the uh, passengers' luggage out of the hold in scoops. Uh, it's basically a slurry. <laughs> so you know, it's kind of a mess. Um, also, almost everything in this picture would have been broken on that trip. Uh, there's several passenger accounts. It's a bit of a mess. Um, she sadly ended up her days as a basically floating bull board in Liverpool. Uh, she spent the last of her days through the 1880s to about 1888 doing that. Um, they did several vaudeville acts on board. Um, basically, we were just trying to get as many people to come out and visit it, but she never sailed again. Uh, it took them three years to scrap this ship from 1888 to 1891. She gave up a good fight. She tried. Okay, so it took about about thirty years before anyone attempted to build something to the next biggest. Um, that was going to be the Inman Line, and so they built two sisters: the SS City of New York as well as the city of Paris. Uh, New York was slightly larger than the Paris, but Paris was the speed queen of the two. Um, so you, first time you're now at 10,500 tons, 560 feet long. Um, New York, she was always agreed to be one of the kind of the clipper type. She was a very pretty ship when you look at her. She's got very fine lines. Um, relatively obscure history. She, did her job through uh, 1901 when she went in for a refit. Um, I'm get that button right here eventually. Uh, this will be dining saloon on the SS City of New York. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is they learned their lesson from the Great Eastern and they bolted down the chairs. Uh, they swivel, so you can swivel in and out of the seat, but most of the time your tables are gonna be in long uh, lines like this for quite some time. But they also started to put large overhead domes to let in more natural light into the dining saloon. So. Sorry about that. Uh, there we go. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right. I need to be really close. I thought I was close enough. There we go. Um, dining saloon on the SS City of New York. You're going to have a large overhead dome to let in more natural light. Um, swivel style seats, they're still bolted down, but they are not going to move on you. So this kind of became the, the regular way that first class passengers ate for a couple of decades. In 1901, uh, the New York went in for a re-engineing and reboilering, uh, lost one of her funnels, um, but still had her nice graceful lines. Um, still has that upper bow as well as a figurehead, uh, one of the few liners that actually had one. Uh, she did service in the Spanish-American War as well as in World War I as an armored cruiser as well as a troop transport. Um, to most Titanic buffs, she's probably the most famous for this picture. Uh, on the way out of Southampton, uh, Titanic was passing the Oceanic in New York. Uh, New York was more outboard of Oceanic. The displacement of Titanic go by, going by uh, basically sucked New York into her wake. The, ropes parted, New York broke loose. Uh, one of the tugboats at least managed to finally get a hold of her in the middle there, uh, but not before she came within about six feet of the Titanic. Uh, very close end thing. Uh, it spooked several passengers, a couple of them even getting off in shareboard and things, so this was enough for them. So, um, pretty, one of those ships that had relatively obscure career, um, except for this one moment. The next to come along uh, was Cunard's answer to the city of New York, was the RMS Campania. Uh, she was also Cunard's answer to the Majestic and Teutonic. Um, first time you're getting to 22 knots, uh, about 13,000 tons, so you're still not quite at this, we're not quite at the weight of Great Eastern Old Length yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> uh, the first thing you'll notice, she was also a speed queen, so you notice the massive size of the funnels. Uh, she had absolutely massive uh, 
reciprocating engines that reached almost up into the superstructure. Um, they were just simply amazing pieces of machinery. Um, Campania, she was just another one of those liners that did her job for quite some time. Um, you kind of notice a trend after a while. Uh, unless it sinks, these ships usually just had a regular career. Um, she also had a magnificent dining room. Um, you're going to notice the first floor, as well as they haven't reached a second story yet, but you'll notice it reaches up three decks to an absolutely glorious view. Or dome, I'm so sorry. Um, still long tables and swivel chairs, but you're getting into a much more elegant looking interior. Uh, unfortunately, this is the first time we'll run into a character that some of you may know. Uh, this is C.H. Lightoller. Uh, he was a career seaman. Uh, he was also aboard Campania when this happened. Uh, she ran afoul the Royal Navy battleship at Royal Oak. Uh, basically had a hole torn in it and she started to sink. Uh, this would be the third major liner that Lightoller was on when it sank. So, unfortunately a rather in, in, inglorious end to the Campania. Um, World War I saved her. She was on her way to the scrapyard when the war broke out, but the Royal Navy decided that they would have some good use for her. So, um, so at the same time, all this is going on. The Americans have built theirs. The German or the British have built theirs. Uh, the Germans, on the other hand, they're going. We want in on this as well. And so, in 1889, Kaiser Wilhelm II goes to the Spithead Review, uh, boards the RMS Teutonic, and gets back to Germany and decides, we need some of these on our own. And so he goes to the North German Lloyd, as well as the Hamburg America Line, and said, you will have the government support, we will give you whatever you need, but I want you to build me the biggest and the fastest ocean line in the world. And so North Deutsche Lloyd starts with the first of the four flyers, as they were known. These were a series of ocean liners that just kind of progressively got a little bit bigger and a little bit faster. Um, first one here first is the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross. Uh, first top speed of 22 and a half knots, uh, 14,000 tons and 655 feet long. So we're, we're getting up there in size. Um, these were just magnificent liners. They were the first of the four funnel liners. Um, but you notice they're also in pairs. Um, that was kind of their way of designing them. So they basically were trying to cram as many boilers into these ships as they possibly could. And so uh, they were the true first speed queens of the Atlantic. <laughs> but they went all in oh, the interiors on these guys. The first, no, one of the first major ocean liners to have a two story dining saloon. Uh, so you'll still notice. The chairs are still bolted down. The tables are starting to get a little bit shorter, um, but your room height is still magnificent. It just goes on and on. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross. Unfortunately, she has a successful career until 1914 when the war starts. Uh, she's requisitioned by the German government as a Martin merchant cruiser. And then goes on a raid down towards Africa, and then runs into HMS High Flyer, a uh, light cruiser, and that's not a fight she was gonna come away from. Uh, unfortunately, she was lost during that fight. Uh, this is probably one of my favorites. This is the White Star Liner RMS Oceanic. Uh, she was the, can't say she was the last brainchild of uh, the original founder of the White Star Line, uh, Thomas is name, but just shortly before he died, this was uh, started. Uh, so for the first time, you have a ship that's longer than the Great Eastern, at 704 feet long. Uh, still not quite there in terms of weight, but she is agreed among White Star Line buffs. She's probably one of the prettiest of the White Star Line ships. Uh, just very elegant, tall funnels, three masts, very yacht-like. Uh, she's just a very pretty ship. 
uh, C.H. Lytoller, uh, another that character again, he always <coughs> believed that Oceanic was his favorite. <clears throat> there we go. Um, Oceanic, her dining saloon was a bit of a callback from the German liners. Uh, you, you lost a little bit of height, but you had these large murals. There were four murals in her dining room, each representing a different, um, uh, different region. So you had Great Britain, uh, the North America, Liverpool, as well as New York, as well as a massive hill over over top. You have a little bit darker New York as well, um, which kind of was the style at the time. Unfortunately, Oceanic uh, is another liner we lost to World War I. Uh, C.H. Lightalk was on board when they were on a patrol. She was being used as an armed merchant cruiser for the Royal Navy, and she was on a patrol in the Orkneys and Shetland Islands. Or Shetland Islands. Uh, they kind of lost their way and ran aground off of one of the islands, and she was lost. Um, they made no attempt to try and get her off because they realized any attempt to get her off was to, she was just going to sink on the spot. So basically, they salvaged what they could. Uh, Light Taller went back on board, grabbed the clock off the bridge, and kept it as a memento. And so <laughs> he kept that till his dying days. Um, just a rather waste of a gorgeous piece of machinery, unfortunately. But next, you start getting into a little bit different. Uh, White Star Line took a bit of a different tack in the early 1900s. Uh, they decided they weren't going to try and compete for speed anymore, they, but they did decide they could compete with size and luxury. And so you started to get, you got the first of what was known as the Big Four. Uh, this is going to be the Celtic, the Seagrid, the Baltic, and the Adriatic. Uh, Celtic was the first. Relatively low top speed, 16 uh, knots, but she's just a hair shorter than Oceanic, but she is the first of the liners in weight greater than uh, Great Eastern. And you know, they reached 20, almost 21,000 tons. Um, she started a trend that continued for a lot of liners for about the next five years, put her a balanced approach, four masts, two funnels, a little bit lower speed, but more luxury, uh, something the Germans caught on here. Uh, the Big Four, amazingly, they were. It, White Star Line was always cursed with this inability to, to have a career ship that lasted longer than a short period of time. Uh, but they had a very long career. All of these four liners survived into the 1920s and 30s. Um, and so they had a few incidents during World War I. Uh, Celtic uh, was torpedoed, uh, ran into a line, but survived. But unfortunately, relatively benign uh, dining saloon. You've still got bolted down chairs and the long uh, tables, but you're starting to see them break up from being great big long tables. You're starting to get into tables that are four and eight people at a time. And so, unfortunately, she ran aground off of Queenstown in 1928, uh, White Star Line decided that she was not worth salvaging, and so they broke her up on the spot. And so that was the unfortunate end of the Celtic. Uh, Cedric, just a little bit bigger, um, virtually identical. Every one of these ships, White Star Line added a little bit, of, a little few things that weren't maybe on the previous ship that they decided was a good idea. You can try that. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. First time jitters. Um, Cedric's just a little bit heavier, uh, about the same length, one knot faster. Uh, they decided they were going to try and go with a uh, balanced approach from Liverpool to New York, get into the routine. So one of these ships was always traveling across the Atlantic while the other one was in port getting refueled and things like that. Started to get a little bit nicer dining saloon, uh, a little bit better dome, uh, a little bit more ornate than the uh, Celtic. Uh, kind of went back to the Oceanic, kind of more of the murals that kind of wrapped around. You also notice that for the first time the tails have actually gotten quite a bit smaller. 
a little bit more intimate. intimate. Um, Baltic, um, again, just a little bit bigger, one knot faster, virtually the same in terms of what she looked like before. Um, the Baltic was one of the ships that had, she always seems to pop up in history with ships. Uh, she was there to rescue the passengers from the Republic in 1909. Uh, she also uh, tried to attempt to come to Titanic's rescue, uh, but she was unfortunately too far away. Um, but this was really the first time you get down to very small four-person tables. Because by that point, even White Star Line is going, all right, let's break this up a little bit, make this a little bit more intimate so we can try and compete with the Germans. Uh, Adriatic, the next sister, was um, just a hair bigger again. Uh, how many of you may notice this gentleman from this picture? This is Captain E.J. Smith. Uh, he went on to command the Titanic a few, a few years later. Baltic was sold in Japan uh, for scrap in 1933. Uh, meanwhile, Hamburg America Line is looking up what the Light Star Line is doing and decides to go with a uh, little bit similar approach. And so you're going to see a balanced approach again, four masts, two funnels, um, just a hair bigger again, 25,000 tons, 677 feet. Interiors, though, I wish I could have found a better picture of her dining saloon, but uh, very intimate. Really, the first time you start to notice uh, just tables for two I mean, tables for four instead of tables for six and eight. Uh, she had a relatively short career with the Germans. Uh, she was uh, ceded to the Allies at the end of World War One. Uh, given to the Canadian Pacific, who renamed her the RMS Empress of Scotland. Uh, she had a relatively successful <laughs> career until the 1930s when she was scrapped. Um, basically, once the Empress of Britain was finished, she was uh, her replacement. At the same time, all this is going on, uh, the Germans have built the Sweet Speed Queens. They've also built the largest in the world, and then White Star Line built theirs, and Cunard's fallen behind with the uh, Campania, and so they decided they needed to build their answer. Uh, and so uh, Cunard went to the British government and said, we want you to help us build the largest and fastest social liners in the world, but we will also give you to the government, give them back to the government to be used in the event of war. And so they were built to admiral admiralty standards. Uh, they had much stronger hulls. They were also fitted with uh, positions for deck guns. Lusitania is the first ship over 31,000 tons, or sorry, 30,000 tons, 787 feet long. Um, between her sister, she was always a bit of my, usually a bit more of my favorite. <laughs> A absolutely magnificent dining saloon on Lusitania. Um, you have a large open well here in the middle, but a large central dome as well as more intimate tables on the upper floor, and then the larger six, eight tables, uh, person tables on the lower floor. And so each sister, uh, Lusitania and Mauritania, went with different approaches in terms of their interior design. Uh, Lusitania was painted in more, uh, a lot more cream, a lot more white. Uh, she was always felt like she was a little bit more open on the inside just because of how much brighter it was. Uh, you'll notice the interiors of her sister Mortini here in just a moment are a little bit different. Um, unfortunately, uh, Lusitania, as many of you know, uh, another victim of World War I, uh, May 7th, 1915, uh, she's sailing off the Irish coast and runs afoul of Captain Schweiger at the U-20 goes down in 18 minutes, almost 1,300 lost. Um, still one of the greatest disasters in the Cunard line. Uh, this is one of uh, my favorite pictures from Stephen Walker. This is uh, Lusitania and her, basically her final guys. Uh, she was sailing across the Atlantic on her last voyage. Um, 
black funnels just to try and help disguise her. You're never going to disguise a large four funnel ship, but they thought it might be. So. <laughs> Um, the next one, this is Artemis Mortania. Um, she's probably one of the great immortals of the uh, ocean liner world. Um, just a hair bigger than Lusitania, but she was also always the fastest. Um, she held the speed record until 1927 when the Bremen was built. So she held the speed record for quite a considerable time. Um, they tried to compete with the Germans at the end of her career and they just couldn't get anywhere close. But she had a very successful career. She was very popular, um, uh, very popular with the Americans. Uh, this was FDR's favorite ocean liner to travel across the Atlantic on. Uh, but you'll notice the dining saloon, much like the rest of Mauritania, they went with the, the more natural wood approach. So you had a lot of darker woods, um, kind of more of that hunting lodge approach to it on the inside. Probably a little bit more um, comforting, I guess you could say. Uh, but very similar design, though. So you still got this two, the two stories, but with the large overhead dome. Um, but it's just you know, much different look with the unpainted woodwork, more of a varnished look. And this is how she spent her last final years in the 1930s. Uh, King Art set her on cruises. She was painted white in an attempt to cut down on the heat. Uh, unfortunately, all these ships were built without air conditioning. And so white paint was kind of their idea to try and repel the heat. And supposedly it worked only marginally. Um, this would be White Star's answer to Lusitania and Mortania. Uh, the first of the three sisters, this is Armas Olympic of the White Star Line. The first idea for the concept with White Star came about in 1908. Uh, Olympic would be launched in 1911, and, or sorry, her maiden voyage would be in 1911. Um, had a relatively successful career, um, so much so that she's always the forgotten sister, but that's just because she was the one sister that actually did what she was supposed to, and that was take passengers back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I, it, it's always hard to try and quantify Olympic and Titanic with the general public just because they've got they've got the notions from the, the Cameron movie that Titanic and Olympic, you know, Titanic and White Star Line ships are the, 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 the biggest and the, the grandest looking ocean liners in the world. But this is going to be a picture of the dining saloon in the Olympic. Uh, you'll notice one thing, it's back to one story. Um, you've got more intimate dining with the two and four and six, eight seat, pa um, seat tables. But unfortunately, Olympic and Titanic's dining saloon were notoriously very hot during the day. Um, even with the portholes open, it could get quite stuffy. But I, that's mainly because there was just nowhere for that heat to go. Um, with that Jacobean style, that little bit more white interior, it did feel very airy and very large. The room was 114 feet long and 92 feet wide, it was the full width of the ship. You could fit uh, basically one sitting at a time, kind of like we do on the Queen Mary 2 here. You had 350 dining in one sitting, and then the next and the next sitting. You couldn't get them all in at the same time. Uh, so that's why they waited in the reception room forward. Uh, Olympic had a very successful career during World War I. Uh, it was a very popular troop transport between uh, Halifax England, taking a lot of Canadians over. Uh, she was painted first in gray, and then around 1916, she received this rather garish uh, dazzle design, uh, first uh, designed by Norman Wilkinson, the maritime painter. He came up with this idea, gave it to the Admiralty. Admiralty decided, you know, it's not a bad idea, so we'll just, it's cheap. It helped make the crew feel a little bit more comfortable. And so most of the major liners like Olympic uh, received these dazzle schemes. She is the only known uh, merchant ship during World War I to have actually sunk a German U-boat. Uh, she did that by ramming it. <laughs> <clears throat> and she finished out her career in 1935. Um, 
not too much change. Um, they obviously after Titanic they put on more lifeboats and tried to make the tried to, they just updated their interiors as they as they went along. Uh, unfortunately, by 1935, they had decided that they were going. They needed to change the grand staircase up enough. So, if you remember Titanic's grand staircase with that fine varnished woodwork, by the time Olympic was retired, that grand staircase was a very ugly green. I'm not quite sure what they were thinking with that. And then we come to the most famous, the one always <laughs> everyone always remembers. Uh, this is a picture of Titanic. April 8th, a few days before her maiden voyage. She will have the record of being the world's largest liner for four and a half days. Unfortunately, after that, it goes back to her sister Olympic. Um, uh, Titanic, I, I could spend an hour up here talking about Titanic alone, but I don't think you guys want to hear me do that. Um, but there are so many good repositories for Titanic books, movies. The Cameron movie gets it about 75% right these days. Um, but interior-wise, dining room is exactly the same as Olympics, just a few window changes, but that's about it. This is the only known photograph taken of Titanic's dining saloon. This was taken by Father Brown. Uh, he was a passenger who got off on Queenstown, uh, the last ship's protocol before they left the Atlantic. Uh, he took this around breakfast time on April 11th just before he got off. Um, it's a bit blurry. Uh, I've had a couple friends who tried to identify anyone from the picture, but it's just, it's kind of hard to make out. Um, Father Brown is the most well-known among the Titanic community for saving Titanic's interiors for posterity. Um, thanks to him, we have, we have no idea what the inside, inside of Titanic would look like otherwise. So, um, kind of segueing into the post-war period here, uh, so you're going to see the White Star Liner Georgic, the Olympic Leviathan, as well as the uh, New York and the uh, Paris, I don't know, that's the old France, uh, New York in the 1920s. So, one thing I always try to tell people about Titanic, um, when they, they always say, was the biggest ship in the world. It's like, well, one, she was only for four and a half days, then she went to Olympic. She wasn't even going to be the biggest ship in the world for more than about another year. At the same time that you had the great Titanic kerfuffle, uh, you had the Germans building their answer to the White Star Liners. This would be the SS Imperator. This was the first ocean liner over 50,000 tons, the first one over 900 feet long. Uh, 906 feet long, she was just a little bit longer, but she was about 5,000 tons heavier than uh, Cunard's final answer, the Aquitania, which unfortunately I know is a lot of people's favorites, but she didn't make the list. Um, the Imperator is, she has a few nicknames over the course of her career in the ocean liner community that is uh, unfortunate, but kind of funny at the same time, we poke fun of her a lot. She is affectionately known as the SS Limperotter. Uh, you can see now she almost perpetually had a list to one side throughout most of her career. Uh, for the first year, the Germans tried to fix what they could. They chopped nine feet off the top of the funnels. They removed several thousand tons of the marble and replaced most of the upper story furniture with wicker as well as filling her ballast tanks with about 2,000 tons of concrete and only helped a little bit. Uh, she's also one of the last ocean liners ever built that had a giant figurehead. Uh, you'll notice the eagle on the front. That was the German's way of concreting the fact that she was going to be longer than the Aquitania. <laughs> uh, the eagle lasted three voyages before it went through a storm and it ripped both the wings off of it. And so they replaced it with something a little bit more subtle after that. <laughs> But one of the most absolutely gorgeous dining saloons I have ever seen on the ship. Um, you have the large well, you've got the intimate tables, the nice white woodwork, um, very open, very friendly feeling place to it. And even after uh, 
uh, World War One when she was uh, basically uh, continued her career at the Cunard Line. They they couldn't remove the the essence of what it was, and so the space didn't really change that much. They changed it up just enough. Um, not just a magnificent looking world. She would finish out her career in 1930, uh, 1938, um, but not before becoming one of the first Cunard queens. Uh, she is named after Queen uh, Berengaria, wife of Richard the Lionheart. Uh, she would have a relatively successful career in the 1920s. She was very popular. Uh, she was one of Captain Rostrum of the Carpathia's famous favorite ships. Um, I think she looks absolutely gorgeous in Cunard red. Much better than the German appearance. <laughs> um, she finished out her career in the 1930s doing very cheap booze cruises out of New York uh, to thirsty Americans during the Great Depression and Prohibition. Um, so basically, for 100 bucks, you could sail out for 12, 24 hours, get a drink, and come back. Um, she was derided as the SS bargain area because of that. At the same time, they continued um, Hamburg, America Line. They decided that Albert Ballon, uh, the head of the, the America Line, he wanted to continue. He wanted to keep making the biggest and the best. And so they continue on the next year with the SS Barzalon. Um, again, just a couple tons, a uh, couple thousand tons heavier. Um, first one was 950 feet long. She has probably the least. I can't say least interesting, but she has probably the, yeah. yeah, she she uh, had only had several trips to North America before she was stuck in New York when World War One broke out. Um, again, very similar dining saloon. They kind of went away with the open well on the second floor, blasted in, but you still had um, that. It started to become known for having private dining rooms on the second floor. Uh, the, the first floor was for the, just the regular passengers, the regular paying passengers, and then the upper floors were for the, the more opulent, the more private. Um, she gets stuck in North America at the beginning of World War I. She stays there until the United States enters in 1917, uh, becomes the SS Leviathan, uh, one of the most well-known troop ships of World War I. Um, the story goes that she was named by the wife of Woodrow Wilson, the president. I've heard several stories about that, though. <laughs> um, she is basically ceded to the United States at the end of the war. Um, not for, I think, from what I understand, she wasn't given to the Americans just because they claimed her. They were given to her just so that the French didn't get her. Um, that was the story I heard. After World War I, she's given to the um, United States Lines and um, Francis Gibbs, a well-known naval architect, whose name you may know from all the, uh, later ocean liner history, the designer of the SS United States. Uh, this was really one of his first big gigs. Um, after the war, they went to the Germans and they asked for the original blueprints for the ship. Uh, Hamburg American Line said, fine, we'll give you the blueprints, but we want a million dollars. Uh, he decided, no, that's too much for us, and so he spent the next eight months crawling through the ship, coming up with his own new blueprints, as well as redesigning the ship uh, to be a little bit safer. They rewired it, they converted the boilers into more oil, um, lightened it up just a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, Leviathan is also an American ship. Uh, prohibition's going on. She was the least popular of the major liners in the 1920s and 30s, simply because you could not get a drink on board the ship. <laughs> they tried, they really tried, and they could not succeed. She was also hamstrung by the fact that she didn't have a running mate. But this is gonna be the next sister. Uh, this would be one of my favorites. This is gonna be the SS Bismarck, uh, later known as the RMS Majestic. She was launched just before World War I in 1914, uh, never finished during the war. Um, there were rumors that cropped up all during World War I that the, the Bismarck would be finished and she was going to be the Kaiser's uh, 
private yacht as he did a congratulatory round the world cruise after the Germans won World War I. Um, that never happened. Um, but after the war, the uh, Allied powers were trying to figure out again what to do with these big ocean liners. Uh, uh, the Imperator was given to the Cunard Line as a replacement for Lusitania, she became very area. Leviathan was given to the United States, and then the Bismarck was given to the White Star Line as a replacement for the loss of the Majestic, or sorry, the loss of the Britannic in 1916, the Titanic's all younger sister, which only had a successful career as a hospital ship and there was an ocean liner. Um, the story goes that when she was being finished in Germany before she was given to the White Star Line, um, she was met by a White Star Line crew. Uh, the Germans had finished her as Bismarck, not Majestic. And so to convert her first, they had to repaint everything into White Star Line colors. They had to paint out the name, put on Majestic. They had to clean out the captain's cabin because they decided they were going to use it as a storage closet. But a simply magnificent dining saloon. Um, again, you have the second story private uh, dining areas with the windows there, but you have the um, first floor wide open dining rooms. These rooms were close to 150 feet long, full width of the ship. Uh, of the three German sisters, each one could see all first class passengers at the same time, close to 700 people. I think when she becomes the White Star Liner Majestic, she looks just a little bit better, but I might be a little biased. Uh, she becomes the largest ship in the world. Uh, finally, in the 1920s, uh, White Star Line achieved what they always wanted, a three-ship service. So you had the uh, Olympic, Majestic, as well as the Homeric. Um, they were, neither, none of them was the fastest, but they at least White Star Line got to claim that they had the biggest. Um, this would be her big claim to fame for the next 12 years. Um, 56,000 tons, 956 feet long. They, again, they tried to take the, the Teutonic German essence out of her, but they just couldn't succeed. <clears throat> now this is probably one of the ocean liner buffs most agreed upon to be the most gorgeous ocean liners ever built. This is going to be the SS France of the French line, a, the true epitome of an Art Deco ocean liner. I believe it was Bill Miller, he always said that this is every little boy's image of what a true ocean liner should look like. So you have the first ocean liner over a thousand feet long at 1,029 feet, as well as the first ocean ocean liner over 80,000 tons. Her, her tonnage would fluctuate over the course of her career, mostly to compete in size with the Queen Mary. Um, she is a simply magnificent liner in every sense. Um, her career, she would not be known as one of the most successful ocean liners in the 1930s, just in terms of passenger carriage. Um, her interiors tended to scare away a lot of the general public. They tended to go with something a little bit more mundane, like one of the Cunard liners, um, which she was very popular with the American crowd in France. Uh, you'll see that here in her dining saloon. This is a dining saloon 300 feet long. over 50 feet wide and 26 feet tall. Uh, they couldn't see every first class passenger at once, but they could see most of them in this room. You can't imagine coming down the grand staircase and entering a room like this. Um, you notice the, the magnificent light towers down each side to illuminate the space. Um, they were able to do this, have these large open rooms like this, um, thanks to something the Germans invented. And that was where you finally were able to get the center shafts for the smokestacks split and then broken out to each side. And so what that did was that allowed you to have these uptakes outside and so you had a central corridor down the middle that you could have these great big long open rooms on. It really opened up the interiors of these ships. Unfortunately, uh, she was a victim of World War II. Um, she was, she, literally sailed into New York about three days before World War I, uh, sorry, World War II started in 1939. Um, when the war broke out, 
the French line said, stay in New York until this is all settled and we'll figure out what to do later. Uh, she was left with a skeleton crew and then basically sat out in the war for the next couple of years. Um, there are some famous photographs taken in New York in this period and you'll see pictures of the Normandy, Queen Mary, and the Queen Elizabeth all tied up together. Uh, they were known as Monsters Row for a couple of months, just to see the three biggest ocean liners in the world all together at the same time. Uh, in 1941, uh, just after December 7th, she would be requisitioned by the U.S. government as a troop transport. Um, unfortunately, when, uh, if you're an American, you know the saying, I'm the government and I'm here to help. Uh, she ran afoul of that. Um, she needed to be turned into a troop transport very quickly. They basically gave her five weeks to be turned into a troop transport. Uh, she was taken over by the Navy, turned into the USS Lafayette, and then conversion started. Uh, unfortunately, during that conversion, they were removing one of the light stanchions in the lounge with a welder's torch. Unfortunately, next to that light tower was a massive stack of life preservers made out of havoc. Very final. And so the fire started. Uh, the Navy, in, it, in, in its infinite wisdom, decided they were going to basically unplug the ship's firefighting system. And so she had one of the most up to date firefighting systems on any ocean liner at the time. It was touted as one of the best at sea. Navy just cut it out and said, no, nah, wait for the Navy. We can do it better. And so she burned at her pier in February of 1942. At first, they, they tried to douse it with fire hoses. Unfortunately, on ships, when you have a fire, there is nowhere for that water to go. And so it started to pool on the port side. Fire boats come along, they pour more water onto the ship, and eventually, in the middle of the night the next day, the ship capsized into the Hudson River. And that was the end of her career. Uh, and then started one of the truly greatest salvage efforts in ocean liner history, and in fact, in any maritime history, uh, nothing short of maybe the Pearl Harbor salvage of the battleships after Pearl Harbor. Um, they spent the next 18 months uh, stripping off the superstructure as well as the funnels, uh, sealing up all the openings, and then just slowly pumping around. Um, after a couple weeks, uh, she was upright. She was towed to Brooklyn. Um, where it was found out that by 1943, when they got her upright and pumped out, they really didn't need her anymore. And so she was set aside mainly during the rest of the war, and no one took much interest in a half burned out ocean liner, not even to get turned into an aircraft carrier. And so in 1946, uh, she was, after the war, she was offered back to the French line saying, hey, <laughs> War's over. Do you guys want her back? The French said, like, nope, we don't want her. That's her. You guys can do with her whatever you want. And so she was sold for scrap to the Lipset Corporation in New Jersey, and that's where she ended up. It took a couple months, and then she was gone. Um, a terrible end to possibly one of the greatest ocean liners ever built. Um, Normandy set a trend uh, that would continue for the next thing, you know, of the true ocean like super liners. Um, Normandy was getting all the claim, the fame. She was the fastest, she was the biggest. The British at the same time uh, during the Great Depression were struggling, um, the Cunard Line and the White Star Line. Uh, Cunard was attempting to build a ocean liner number 534 in Glasgow. Oceanic was being built by the White Star Line who never got very far with her. Uh, mainly because White Star and Harlan and Wolf couldn't decide how to put the propulsion system in the ship. It was, it was going to be steam turbines and diesels. Uh, and because of that, by the time they came up with the idea, White Star went bankrupt, basically, at the end. And so in the early 1930s, um, Cunard went to the British government and said, we would like the, your guys' help to finish the Queen, or finish hall number 534. She didn't have a name yet, I'm sorry. Uh, Parliament, the British government said, fine, uh, Cunard will help you out. We'll give you a stipend to help finish the ship, but you've got to take on White Star Line as a junior partner. And so in 1934, it became known as Cunard White Star in a uh, 
3862 split in terms of the take. Kinghart had the greater majority of the share. Uh, she also had the greatest number of ships. Uh, White Star would come, uh, put in 10 ships. Kinghart would put in 15. And so over the course of the continuing years in the 1930s, you saw a very steady, quickly decline in the number of White Star ships. But you'll notice Kinghart's ships kind of stuck around, unfortunately. Um, and so they got the money to finish their big project, whole number 534, which became known as the RMS Queen Mary, uh, the predecessor to the ship you're on to this day. Uh, 80,000 tons, uh, 1,019 feet, uh, 1, feet long. She's not quite as big as the Normandy, but she took the speed uh, record, the Hales Trophy, as well as the Blue Ribbon from the Normandy. They attempted to, I guess you could say, Norman, or Queen Mary was a bit of a callback. Um, Normandy was a bit much for people, uh, and so Kinar noticed that. And so when they were designing Queen Mary, they, they, they tended to be a bit more reserved. And so her interiors are, there are deco, but they're very more subtle. They're not, they're not over the top. They're not gonna make people not want to travel on your ship. Uh, Queen Mary's kind of always been described as an overgrown Aquitania. Uh, she's uh, a bit bulky. Um, she's not nearly as aerodynamic as the Normandy, but she has a certain charm to her. Um, she is faster by the Normandy, not because of her great underwater hull. It's not streamlined. It's, she just simply had the much stronger propulsion system. She had just a much, much higher horsepower output. And so basically she just forced her way through the Atlantic. She has a very nice dining saloon, which you can still go see today in Long Beach. Um, it's one story, uh, it goes the width of the ship though. Um, has one of the neat things about it, it has a little uh, map of the dining saloon in it. They always had a little ship on the map that showed you exactly where the ship's uh, position was that day where you're eating, which was, that was kind of neat. Um, she became known in World War II as the Grey Ghost, uh, tra traveling basically around the world several times. Um, this ship has the still carries the record for the most number of people carried by one ship in one trip. They carried 16,000 troops in one trip across the Atlantic on the Queen Mary. I can't imagine how they did that, but they managed. This is her today, and you'll also notice in the background the ship looks a little similar. Uh, about 10 years ago, during one of her anniversaries, uh, Cunard sent the Queen Mary 2 down to visit Long Beach and had a very nice photo op with the original Queen Mary. Um, Queen Mary today, she's had a bit of a rundown history in the past. Uh, let's say since she got to Long Beach in the 70s, she wasn't exactly well taken care of. Um, Disney had their go in the 80s and 90s. That didn't work out so well. It's just been a sad decline, but it's it's kind of nice to see though in the last year the city of Long Beach has actually took an ownership of the ship completely and has done a lot of work on the ship to clean it up. Um, they unfortunately did have to remove the lifeboats, but that's mainly because they were starting to rust out and in danger of collapsing onto the deck. Uh, they have said that they're gonna replace those with fiberglass replicas in the near future. Um, if you look at the pictures of the ship today, they've replaced a lot of the old linoleum uh, that was put down in the 80s and 90s. That's a little bit more representative, good representation of what she looked like when she was in service. Uh, they've also cleaned up a lot of the woodwork, as well as they've replaced a lot of the overhead lighting uh, with uh, kind of soft LEDs instead of the, the gross neon lights that she had for a long time. And so um, it's nice to see that she's finally kind of getting the care of and taking care of that she needed to be. At the same time as Queen, Mar uh, Queen Mary was being saved by the British government, they also decided, you know, if you can give, you know, give us a couple more million pounds, we can make a, a, a running mate. And so they said, that's fine, it's a good idea. And they gave them a couple more million pounds and they decided they were going to build the Armors uh, Queen, Eliz uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, she would be launched not long before World War II started, but she would be finished during the war. Um, she would eventually become the longest ship in the world, or 
biggest ship in the world on this list. Um, this is kind of where I wanted to end it because after this you start getting into the cruise ships. And I'm not sure many of you would really be interested in that. Uh, <laughs> just a whole other can of worms there. Um, but Queen Elizabeth, she would also go on to become a troop ship um, during World War II before she was turned into an ocean liner again after World War One. Or sorry, after World War Two in 1946. She, not as well known in terms of the ocean liner community as her sister, the Mary, but she had, they kind of take the lessons that they had learned from the Normandy and things they had done on the Queen Mary and decided we wanted to dress it up just a little bit. And so they kind of cleaned her up a little bit. They got down to two funnels, just a little bit more streamlined. Um, interior wise, very similar to the Queen Mary, a little bit wider in appearance, it's a little bit lighter. And she would have a, she basically had a very successful career after World War II with her sister. They basically just bounced back and forth between South Pampa and New York every four days. Um, very profitable for the Cunard line until the 1950s and 60s when airplanes finally started to take over. Um, she would be retired. sold to, to a group in Fort Lauderdale down in Florida. Not sure why they decided they needed the Queen Elizabeth, but they wanted to turn her into a tourist attraction. Uh, she basically failed at that before she was sold to a Chinese shipping magnate, C.Y. Tong. They, he turned her into the uh, SS C.Y.G. University. And just as the C.Y.G. University was being finished in Hong Kong, series of rather mysterious fires broke out. Um, it's never been agreed as to the exact cause, but you talk to most people in the ocean liner world and they'll say it was probably arson. Um, just a very sad end to a truly magnificent ship. Um, she's also uh, well known for having a bit of a cameo. If you've ever seen the James Bond film, Man with the Golden Gun, uh, she was one of the secret bases that Bond boards in the movie. And then we come to the one we're on. We marry two. Uh, she's a little bit closer to 150,000 tons today, 1,132 feet long. She's been in service since 2004. Uh, I've never heard that Cunard plans to retire anytime soon, so we'll be seeing her for quite some time to come. Uh, one thing I did kind of want to point out the dining saloon you'll notice today, if you had to pick uh, which of the ships in the past. The dining saloon looks most like uh, today, I would say probably one of the German liners, not the Queen. <laughs> but the Quebec, a very magnificent dining room though. And then this will be the end of the presentation. Again, this is a uh, picture of the some of the two biggest ocean liners in the world at the time, Normandy and Queen Mary, at the beginning of World War II. Um, that's kind of the end of my presentation. I'll be here if you have any questions. by the nation will give her charm and dignity British labor gave its skill and it's giving me a thrill oh, I'm happy and gay cause I'm sailing away I booked my trip for the USA on the finest ship in the world the Queen Mary how do you like to come with me? The ship is all British. It's wonderful, too. 
the ship is manned by a British crew. So when I go over the sea, the Queen Mary takes me. There'll be fun galore and people I'll adore. That's why I'm happy and gay, cause I'm sailing away. I booked my trip for the USA on the finest ship in the world. The Queen Mary, Queen of the Sea. We're moving. Yes, and what a ship we're going on. Why, she's the finest ever built. Here's wishing you all prosperity, Queen Mary, on your maiden voyage or the ocean blue. British officers will sail you, and your crew will never fail you. Like your builders, they are British through and through. That's why I'm happy and gay, cause I'm sailing away. I booked my trip for the USA on the finest ship in the world, the Queen Mary, 